Please listen carefully. Welcome to the Big Ideas for Better Places podcast from CityWorks Expo. My name is Brad Stevens, and it's my absolute pleasure to introduce you to our guest today, Ms. Carolyn Zellico, an associate director at the Aspen Institute and the founder and director of the Hometown Summit. How are you doing today? I am doing well, and thank you so much for having me on the program, Brad. Well, of course, it's a pleasure. I know it's a, it's a Friday afternoon, so you're probably winding down for the week, but I, I appreciate you taking <laughs> the time, and, and, and hopefully we'll get into some 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 interesting thoughts today. But I kind of, you know, uh, you've been doing this work for a few years now, and I wonder if you could kind of express where you think your place is in the broader discussions of what makes communities work or, or where you kind of see your work fitting into that. Definitely. So um, as you mentioned, I have I have two jobs. Um, the first is at the Aspen Institute, which is a um, global policy center that's based in D.C., has uh, 13 international affiliates, um, is um, a, a significant and long-standing uh, convener in the field of policymaking, everything from uh, education to national security. Um, and, and my role there is uh, to help develop a program that brings um, our signature style of dialogue and um, our resources as, as a convener, um, as as an entity that brings people um, from diverse sectors and walks of life together um, to the challenges um, facing middle America right now. So getting beyond some of our usual, our usual bubble of um, uh, New York, D.C., um, and kind of the other, other uh, global capitals. Um, so that, that, uh, that being said, I think what we're going to be talking about most today is a project um, that I'm working on in Charlottesville, Virginia, and have been for about two years now, um, called the Hometown Summit. Um, the Hometown Summit is uh, America's leading forum uh, for small cities. Um, it will take place this spring, April 11th through 14th, 2018. Uh, for listeners out there, uh, I encourage you to grab your ticket now. They're 175 <laughs> bucks. Um, and prices will go up on December 31st. So uh, now, now is the time to, um, to to grab one of those, and, um, and and you can do that and just learn more about what we're doing at tomtomfest.com, t o m t o m f e s t dot com uh, backslash hometown. Um, and then there's there's all kinds of information about the programming and the tickets. But um, uh, just to return to your question of how do I envision my work. Um, you know, uh, Brad, you and I were talking earlier this week about a lot of the limitations of events. That events don't um, they don't put uh, food on the table, they don't um, clothe the naked, they don't perform a lot of the really critical um, and inspiring work of direct service nonprofits. But what I what I um, uh, think that I think that um, events like the one that I run can accomplish, and what's actually really critical is they can spark um, deeper dialogue and inquiry about kind of the why. Um, so um, many, many city leaders, including those individuals who are working so hard um, to care for their neighbors, don't often get to step back and say, okay, well, what are the, what are the structural um, systems that have created these problems in the first place? And what can I do as, you know, Jane Doe in Lawrence, Kansas or Akron, Ohio, to try and be a voice uh, to inflect those um, those kind of that deeper framework um, for the world that we live in, and um, it's not an opportunity that's often afforded to citizens in smaller cities. Um, but the fact is that there are 93 million of us um, in the United States who are living in smaller metros, and um, and we need to have a voice. Um, and some of these bigger policy conversations, because if we don't, um, then others will speak for us, and um, and and uh, their interests are not always aligned with um, with those um, of America's hometowns. Um, so that's that's kind of the that's sort of the big picture of of what we're trying to do. Well, I'm intrigued. I think that we across the country have kind of seen a resurgence in people that are interested in placemaking and community development. And it's, I'm intrigued how you, as someone on the younger side of things, kind of got interested in these com- conversations and why 
uh, you now think it's so important to take a step into doing some of this stuff, even uh, before you were getting paid, and now you're getting paid to do some of it. But wh- why was this so important to you? Um, well, I will say that um, it's not something that I kind of grew up in. Uh, when I was uh, in high school and college, um, I kind of thought I might do international development. I mean, I explored all different kinds of things, as, as many of us do. Um, uh, it really wasn't until I started working um, in my hometown of Charlottesville, Virginia, after graduating from school, um, that I got hooked. And uh, basically, I was, I was working for the nonprofit that I work with now, Tom Tom Founders Festival, which is this incredible um, week-long event that is just um, uh, uh, such a concentration of energy and hopefulness in our city. And uh, the process of bringing that about, of <laughs> working with uh, neighborhood associations, uh, uh, elected officials, uh, city staff, and then you know, hundreds of local nonprofits and volunteers. Um, it really gave me an insight into how cities function, how they function well and how they function not so well. And, um, and when, I, when I transitioned from TomTom to the Aspen Institute and, um, and discovered that um, sort of the smaller town or smaller city perspective is really lacking in a lot of these policy debates, I thought, you know, this is... Um, this is a solvable problem and it's an important problem to solve. Um, our, our, uh, our, our leaders on the national level, both in media and in policy and in business, um, they would really benefit from, from having closer ties um, with the broader spectrum um, of American communities. Um, so that's, that's kind of, that's kind of what, what drew me into this. Hmm. So I, I, as you, as I hear you talk there, I, I hear that these, you know, you know, being spoken for seems very important, and, and uh, understanding the importance of ideas seems very important. And I wonder, kind of, how how do you get people talking about ideas, and how in a place that doesn't always do that, like in a place that thinks uh, thinks of themselves as a small city and thinks can think small about things, how do you get them to think about ideas in a bigger context? Yeah, I think that so. I think that there are two things. Um, I think the first is kind of to meet people where they are. So, um, you know, you, ha- you have to draw people in by providing programming that's really relevant to, you know, tangible stuff in their lives. And then that can be kind of an, a gateway to exploring some of these bigger questions, if people even have interest in that. The second, um, the second aspect of this is um, treating people like, they deserve to have an opinion and they have a right to have an opinion. I think a lot of people um, throughout their lives, you know, retreat into an area of expertise, myself included. Um, And events are in some ways an invitation and an opportunity to step outside that and take some um, intellectual risks Um, or, you know, and conferences and festivals can do that. Um, and, And the way that I think you make people, comfortable and give them permission for that is to really treat them like VIPs and to treat them like the thought leaders that they read in the New York times, because that's truly what I think. I mean, there, there's, there's no one that I have met at the hometown summit who isn't just as brilliant as um, you know, the op editorial <laughs> writer um, for the, for the Washington post. And so it's saying like, you know, we're, you're going to have an incredible experience. We're going to make sure that the quality of this programming is incredible. The venue will be beautiful. This is not going to be, you know, fluorescent lit um, <laughs> coat closet off the side of a gymnasium. You know, it's um, it's taking those extra steps that may not seem like um, the most uh, critical to just, you know, putting a speaker up on the stage, um, but that really add to the element where people feel like this is a special um, this is a special window, and actually, I'm I'm a special person because of the decisions that I've made um, to commit uh, and dedicate my life and my energies uh, to my community. So, in some ways, it sounds like by just doing the very act of listening to people and and being a good listener, that you can those conversations will perhaps even come about on their own. That's really well said. Yeah, I think it is. It is about listening, um, and it's just and it's. It's about um, honoring people, and and we're trying to actually create more forms for that this year, so it's less of um, 
it's less of a I talk and you listen format. You know, it's less of the panel and the lecture and the talk and more of the seminar round table and workshop so that you know, everybody has a chance to share their perspective and, and share what they what they've learned in the course of their careers. So I'm going to relate this back to something I saw on Facebook today, which is always the, the best place to go for these kind of conversations. <laughs> um, yeah. But we uh, there's some comp- a topic of conversation about a bike lane on a, a fairly prominent road here in Roanoke that just has come up. Um, and there's a gentleman who I- expressed anger and frustration that we were having that conversation instead of having a conversation about poverty and and. Uh, violence in another segment of the city. Uh, how do you kind of uh, bridge those differences when you have people coming together that uh, you're giving them a platform to talk and yet often the conversations they're having maybe even go right by one another without people hearing what the other side has to say? Um, yeah, it's really tough. And I I say this as someone who's, uh, as you say, like uh, younger and, and therefore less experienced in kind of the realm of public discourse. I do. It does feel like we're at an unusually volatile moment um, in conversation. I think some of that's due to the 2016 election. Some of that is social media, which you know gives people a license to be so much more confrontational than they are face to face. And then um, in Charlottesville, things like um, the events of August 12th have really traumatized people. Um, I think in in a clinical way and um, have have really. Ch- shifted the foundations of the kinds of conversations that we're having. And so we, we will have public hearings on a downtown development for like new condos. And it needs, this is a, this is something that happened recently and, and, they, and it, it needs to be shut down by police because mm-hmm. the, the dialogue gets so heated. And I mean, like any city, it's not, necessarily, it's not always or completely a bad thing to, you know, to have um, new housing built at any um end of the market. Um, but there's not, there's not a lot of, um, there's not a lot of room for nuance now. So <clears throat> agreeing with your point, um, I would say, um, that I think, I think if events, um, like the hometown summit can, uh, help build a little bit more common ground or restore a little bit, bit of civility in two ways. Um, first it can give people kind of like a fact based approach, so you can focus on something like in the case that I just mentioned um, of housing, you can focus on form-based code or flexible zoning or micro units or uh, in-law uh, residences. Um, and, and just talking about those ideas that isn't quite as, um, uh, that doesn't sort of uh, raise the same alarm bells as, oh, we're going to build a 10-story luxury apartment building here. Um, so that's, that's number one is to kind of focus on the object in in some instances rather than, um, the, the context. Um, and then I think the other is just in formats. So, um, I've noticed and and in in venue too, I've, I've noticed that, um, you know, uh, formats like our city council, um, tend to be very, uh, very confrontational because it's, you know, a group of, leaders who are sitting on a dais sitting above and like just a few feet away uh from uh, a group of you know uh upset ad- advocates um and it just creates a dynamic of us versus them whereas if you put people on a round table and ask questions like um like what you're asking you know how did you get in- involved in politics um you know what do you want to see for the future of this city like um, what's an incident that you had in the past week that brightened your day in that it relates to the built environment in this city, you know, questions like that, that kind of get people a little bit off of their, um, you know, talking points and more into, um, reflections on their values, on who they are as, as human beings. I think that can be the start to building or, or rebuilding, um, bridges that have been damaged by, um, some of these interactions. Well, I'm I'm in I'm intrigued to kind of uh, hear your thoughts on. So I think that um, you know there was a very famous, at least locally, thing in Richmond where uh, the the mayor of Richmond, uh, the former mayor of Richmond, I believe, proposed the baseball stadium in a very 
interesting, shall we say, location and pretty much had a plan worked out before they went public with it. The public reacted very negatively to that, um, as they often do in a situation like that. But at the flip side, uh, there are always concerns that if you bring the in the public too early or you make too broad of a process that you can't ever get anywhere, that you can't um, develop consensus. And so I wonder kind of how do you weigh those that, that balance between the need to get things done but also the need to involve people as much as possible? Yeah, I think that's, um, I think that's a, a really good question. And I'm actually super excited about um, technologies that are emerging in this space to help with those kinds of questions, most notably on development and the built environment, but also on other issues like, you know, participatory budgeting. I mean, I think where, to me, where, where it comes down is like, um, uh, it's just, it's asking the public for the right questions at the right time and then using their input constructively. So what will often happen with, um, with a, a new development project, um, and and I and Brad, you pro- probably know this, maybe your listeners know this, but I'll just kind of talk through it. It's like, let's say you need to you need to uh, fix a bridge that's no longer structurally sound because it was built 80 years ago. Um, you know, people are going to want different things out of that bridge. Now, instead of what often happens, which is an engineering firm is hired to create a proposal, then that engineering firm does um, civic engagement and we'll revise that proposal down to all of the specifications based on that citizen input. Um, it goes back to citizens. Um, uh, flaws are found, uh, and you know, yet more prototypes are developed or more plans are developed, and the city ends up spending $3 million on an engineering firm, which is you know, maybe a third the cost of the bridge itself, um, and could be much better spent on other sort of, um, you know, and a thousand other uh, services for um, city residents, um, that that instead, um, you know, there's a, there's a researcher at MIT who has this wonderful um, tool that where you use kind of logos and it um, overlays data onto the city. You know, that sort of some hands-on planning tools like that, or even something that's much more low-tech. You know, like with whiteboards or with public mm-hmm. conversations um, to air some grievances. Bef- you know, before a process gets underway and to produce kind of lighter weight prototypes. Um, uh, So I think it's not a matter of do you engage the public or don't you engage the public? Um, You know, in this day and age, uh, we no longer, you know, the emperor doesn't just say I'm going to build a coliseum and it's built, you know, Um, you have to get engaged the public, but I think it's, it's about asking the right questions at the right time. So the public who are not, you know, engineers or career developers and don't know all the constraints um, can offer uh, offer their knowledge, which is which is really helpful um, in in ways that um, that entities can actually absorb. Um, another another project that I've seen, which is really cool, is um, uh, uh, the, you know Facebook uh, and Google have both developed kind of these interactive maps where you can superimpose images on top of um, like a street view in Google. Um, and I and, and the idea of that being a tool for people to flag like oh I'd love for a bike lane to be here and then folks can upvote that or you know it's a shame that this vacant lot isn't a garden or you know th- things things like that so that citizens can share um, share their expertise as citizens and as of users of the environment um, in, um, in in a more kind of uh, organic way. We'd like to take a moment now to say thank you to our sponsors today. The Urban Affairs and Planning Program at Virginia Tech School of Public and International Affairs offers an interdisciplinary approach to understanding planning and policy for mega regions, cities, suburbs, and rural regions in the U.S. and abroad. UAP faculty have expertise in urban planning, architecture, urban design, economics, geography, political science, law, technology, and engineering and provide students with a multifaceted understanding of how communities grow and change. Students apply their knowledge and professional skills by participating in real-world problem-solving with community clients through project-based studios and applied research. UAP emphasizes technical analysis and policy evaluation in approaching the complexities of modern communities. So a big thanks today to the Urban Affairs and Planning Program down at Virginia Tech for being our sponsor. If you'd like to hear more, check them out online. But without further ado, we'll get back to today's guest. Thank you.
But I think that uh, part of this comes back to a shared vision in some ways, and like how do we get there? But I think there's also this this interesting question that uh, I, I've been bumping my head into a lot recently that I'm intrigued to hear your thoughts on, which is more of the how do we get people to view themselves even as a collective before we can get to that shared vision point. So I wonder, you know, I, I'm less familiar with the neighborhoods in Charlottesville than I used to be, but up in D.C., for instance, you've got Northwest and you've got uh, Southeast and Northeast, th these quadrants that are very distinct from one another. And then even within those quadrants, you've got particular neighborhoods and those neighborhoods are changing rapidly. But uh, how do you kind of get people to think collectively about their neighborhoods, but also collectively about the city and, and see themselves as citizens of both, or, or I think that's a, a conversation I'm really interested in these days. Yeah, I think in some ways, like, um, so I was uh, reading, uh, it was also on Facebook, um, from a woman who um, is an advocate for affordable housing in um, one of the Silicon Valley area communities, and um, the the conflict with NIMBYs in that community is shocking. I mean, it's on a, it, there are NIMBYs in every community in Washington and Charlottesville, you know, um, but it's, it's like a fever pitch there. I mean, it's like leaving a horse's head in your, on your front step, kind of like, I mean, not literally, but, um, but it, it really sort of crosses that line uh, between uh, disagreement and, um, and like intimidation. Um uh, and, and so I think, you know, trying to have a round table or broker a piece on those kinds of issues is difficult. Um, and so I would instead suggest, or what I have found to be more effective is bring people together in a celebratory, uh, social setting, <laughs> um, or in some kind of, um, activity that doesn't actually address the challenge head on. I mean, civic institutions like, uh, schools where people are parents together, soccer teams, um, United Way. Uh, those are, you know, that's that that is like the those are the building blocks of um, of a functioning community. And I think when they when they wither is when you start to find people, you know, drawing these uh, really like intense lines in the sand. Um, and it's something that Tom Tom tries to do um, in terms of we host block parties that you know, draw 10,000 people downtown. We have entrepreneurial pitch competitions that are open uh, and accessible to people from all walks of life, you know, ranging from business school students at the University of Virginia to, you know, a, a single mom in uh, Sykesville. Um, uh, and and those, are, those are places where people can interact in a kind of safe and contained way around... Um, around uh, things that are just, you know, generally pleasant. And I think in some ways, like, American cities have forgotten how to be boosters. You know, there's, like, the the classic kind of cheesy image of, you know, the Rotary Club and, uh, you know, Mrs. Dogwood Parade um, riding down the street, you know, on the 4th of July. Like, you know, some of that stuff is not, it's not that we want to bring it back, but I think that kind of activity that's just, you know, civic pride is um, is a really is is important um, and a positive way to to you know bring people together. So, again, coming back to events and like um, when are they useful um, and when are they uh, kind of a good uh, a good uh, way to spend resources in a resource constrained environment um, that that kind of that kind of stuff isn't trivial. You know, um, over time, like the uh, the, you know, Veterans Day Parade. Um, people will kind of hold those memories with them, um, and it defines the sense of a place. Well, I really like this idea that, that really a lot of this stuff can be fixed by building relationships and being around each other, which I think is uh, is more powerful than we often give it credit for. But it's a, I think mm -hmm. it's also a, a really hard thing to measure in some ways. I wonder, uh, how do you get around the fact that you know, whether it's talking to funders or whether it's trying to measure your own accomplishments that, that, uh, you know, the, the, the things that you may be doing that working, there's no way to quantify them. Well, I think you can, I think, you know, some funders get it and some don't. Um, but I think you can, you can quantify stuff like that in terms of saying, well, how many attendees did you have? You know, if you spent, 
a hundred thousand dollars and twenty five people showed up, then <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe there are some questions that should be asked. Um, uh, so um, I think you know I think attendance is kind of the for for big public events like what I'm talking about. That's um that's not a bad metric uh, to begin with. And then also since we do live in such a digital world now, um, coupling that with the abundance of metrics that one can draw um, from digital sources and even applying some of that some of those frameworks to um, to live interactions. Um, I think that's I think that can be one way to approach it. But at the end of the day you just have to you have to find people who get it and who um, you know care enough about these issues that they have like read the literature and, and so on that kind of um, supports these ideas. I wonder to kind of shift gears a little bit here. I wonder. Um, I know that you have a little bit of background, uh, especially through your work with Aspen and stuff on the policy side of things. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit about where the policy side of things is very important, and where the policy side may be less important uh, in terms of finding solutions for some of these issues. Yeah, in some ways, the policy stuff is like. Um, is is really important. It's like the hidden laws of gravity that decide whether a ball, you know, falls out of your hand or flies <laughs> up into the sky. Um, I mean, I think one recent example of that is, um, as you know, and as pro- again, probably most of your listeners know, Virginia is a Dillon rule state. Mm-hmm. Um, so in most instances, you know, the state legislature decides a lot of really critical issues for cities, and we don't have a lot of um, we don't have a lot of room to maneuver on that stuff. So um, when city council in Charlottesville decided to get rid of the Robert E. Lee statue in Emancipation Park, you know, they couldn't do that. That that was just something that they, you know, that's like, that's like me saying, um, you know, I'm going to have Teddy Roosevelt at my conference this spring. That's just not, that just wasn't within their power. Um, and, uh, and, you know, like uh, Baton Rouge has tried to pass a higher minimum wage and they were preempted by the state of Louisiana. I mean, there, there are many, many examples of this. Um, so that's one that's one example that I think is really tangible for people of how policy um, can affect their daily lives. Um, and then the other is um, for sure in stuff like healthcare, which we've all heard this you know nightmares recently of people with you know two thousand dollar a month premiums. Um, you know that that happens for a reason, and uh, and then. In terms of just, uh, the, I mean, the point that we're trying to draw attention to with the hometown summit to some degree is that there are structural forces in our economy that have favored the consolidation of corporations and uh, and of um, uh, entities in general across most of the major sectors of um, activity in cities, ranging from healthcare to financial institutions um, to political institutions. And what that means is that there's an outflow of um, of capital, of intergenerational wealth, of highly skilled jobs um, from smaller cities to larger places. And while people often think of the consolidation of corporations as something that is the natural outcome of the free market um, and economies of scale, in fact, it is the result of regulation um, and uh, steady incremental lobby- lobbying over the past half century from um, those entities which could afford to um, make their views heard on Capitol Hill, namely, um, namely large corporations. So um, I'm not, I'm not anti free market and I'm not anti business by any stretch, but I think that um, small cities and small business, which really go hand in hand, have not really been given a fair hearing over the past few years. And, um, as a result, you mean you see uh, with a new firm creation in the United States is that um, as low as it's been in half a century. Um, so, it's, so again, that kind of stuff it's it's hard to detect and hard to point to in any given moment or any given regulation. But there's kind of an accretion of decisions over time that um, end up producing a result where, for example, like um, you know my friend's dad runs a construction business. And he has told me that he could not found that construction business today due to the density of um, regulation and the difficulty of um, getting financing. Um, so it really, it really does matter in your in your own life, um, whatever kind of um, whatever wherever you may be um, on an in income bracket or wherever else. I think that 
you know, we've seen an, an upswell of non-policy-related endeavors to try and fix things. I mean, the, the number of nonprofits seems to explode every week. Uh, the number of little things such as, you know, I think about Parking Day but you know, and Civic Hackathons, but those kind of things that are non-governmental attempts to try and work around some of these things, uh, I think often spring from a place that, uh, the policy work feels really hard uh, and almost impossible in some ways. Is that uh, is there a way that we can kind of get a, is, is that the right way to go wor- working around it, or how do we get those people reengaged with trying to make policy decisions that matter? You know, um, I, policy work. I think it, it well, it's definitely um, a longer term thing, and um, you know, I've worked on initiatives that never see the light of day. And that's the fate of 90% of legislation, you know, that's developed by very well-connected people in Washington, D.C. with a lot of um, support and, and resources. Um, so, I, so yes, um, policy is a long game, and I don't think it should be, like, the exclusive occupation of, of, of anybody, really. <laughs> um, but um, but I, I also don't I, – I think the issue that I'm more trying to address is that um, – I feel like I often encounter folks who are working really, really hard night and day in their communities, doing things like running accelerators or um, uh, providing, uh, you know, food to the hungry or, uh, you know, advocating for bike lanes. And and they're not necessarily seeing um, that they are that they are fighting against a much larger framework um that's that's you know that the the deck is stacked against them um and in fact i think people often see or feel like oh you know for years for example there was like we're the silicon elbow (laughs) we're the silicon uh shore the silicon bayou like it was silicon everything and it's like it's a real misunderstanding of how our economy works to think that um, that a your community is going to look like Silicon Valley in any um, over any arc of history, and b to even think that what's good for Silicon Valley is necessarily good for you. Um, in many cases, it is not. Um, so uh, I, I think that's kind of more what I'm trying to what I'm trying to get people to be aware of with the hometown summit is not give up your day job or stop working on the things that you're working on, but more like. Be angry. Be concerned about um, about what uh, about the decisions that are being made for you on the federal level, and and know that you have a role in that. Um, and through voting and other uh, forms of participation in the democratic process, people can absolutely have an impact. Um, I, I'm intrigued as to. I, I really like that articulation, by the way, and I think that that's. Uh, it's really compelling because I think that there there are certainly times like we don't want people to stop working on trying to create bike lanes. We don't want people to stop feeding the hungry, but there are systematic things that need to happen. And, you know, playing that long game and the short game at the same time can be really difficult, but I think it's very important. Uh, And I wonder how you kind of um, get people to understand that, you know, these issues are really uh, much more complex and, and that's okay that they that they're that way so i'm thinking you know particularly in terms of feeding the hungry you know uh, if we just had uh, more money to support food banks that that would help this but we know that that solution is actually much more complex and and perhaps not even something we really understand yet how, how do you get people kind of comfortable with understanding that side um i, I mean i think um I think it's about it's about combining. I think it's about peer to peer learning. So it's less about Carolyn Zellico telling people, "Hey, I bet you didn't know that you know <laughs> I'm about to I'm about to blow your mind with some information about food systems in the United States." Um, but more so to bring together who are working on kind of adjacent problems um, to talk to each other, um, and then I think there's a there's a really natural process of discovery of like, oh, like these two things are linked, you know, um, and I should be aware that if I, if I vote for X or if I, um, can be more outspoken about, you know, Y, then, uh, then it will actually, um, it, it actually has, a, it will have a really big impact on, um, the thing on my, on my special issues that I work on every day. 
Um, so I think I think peer learning is like a really is a really fantastic mm. um, uh, resource for that. And then I think also like um, you know at the Humptown Summit, it's it is designed by and for um, folks in small cities, um, but we bring in a ton of leaders from not small cities. So we have already confirmed um, some uh, some senior administrators from the NEA, from the Obama White House, media from Slate, City Lab, Governing, BuzzFeed, um, a researcher from MIT, we're, and we're just getting started. Um, but it's um, but I think part of you know how you can give people uh, a feeling like oh like these wider issues are relevant to me is to actually just put them in touch with the folks who kind of help help who who sort of tell us all what's what's important and what we should care about um, and I think that's like a very helpful mutual exchange um, and the reason that you know all those people from uh, national publications and organizations have said yes to me is because they're like I really want to have a better understanding of what's going on mm. at the local level. And I want to bring that into my reporting and be a little bit more authentic about that. Hmm. So it's really uh, about uh, shared wisdom across boundaries, then, I suppose, in some ways, that the people that, you know, the bureaucrats and the technocrats, that they, uh, they're recognizing that they need the other side, but then also the people that, that live in a community recognize that they have gaps in their knowledge as well. And that, uh, I suppose, in some ways, what we're talking about is, is again, that willingness to listen here, isn't it? Mm-hmm. That's absolutely right. And I mean, I would even add to that that like some of the best panels that I've seen involve like the users of these products to, you know, invoke a tech term. So like um, we are working with a group from Durham to talk about um, a project that they're doing around uh, using data to improve the uh, reentry pathway for returning citizens or citizens who have been justice involved, um, whether or not they spent time in prison. Um, and, um, and, and one of like one of our priorities for that, uh, panel is to include someone who's actually, um, who's actually gone through that Mm -hmm. pipeline and who can speak to like, you know, what the challenges are from, from a first person perspective. And I think, I think hearing from those people who are maybe a little You know, there can often, in in these conferences, it's often kind of like experts talking to experts or professionals talking to professionals, but bringing in some of, like, the the people who are actually affected by these products and decisions, um, I think, can be really um, inspiring and challenging as well. Well, absolutely. And I think that, you know, it requires us to embrace our humility in some ways and say that there are people that understand the situation much better than we do. Uh, and they may not have the same schooling that we do, but that doesn't mean that we're superior to them in any way. Yeah, it gets back to that question of citizen engagement. Like, I think one of those the reasons why that's so hard is because people have been burned so many times mm-hmm. in the past by, like, poorly organized citizen engagement. But, like, ideally, like, you're really benefiting from the wisdom of people who, like, know the ins and outs of what you're trying to do. Um, and so there, there has to be a more positive way, um, of, of bringing that, um, bringing that like knowledge to bear on these problems. Well, I'm, I'm intrigued. I know that you've been, uh, you, I, I believe you were in Europe recently, so I know you travel a fair bit, but I wonder when you go to a new place, like when you showed up in Blacksburg, I don't know if that was your first time there, but, uh, um, when you go to these new places, what are the things that kind of tip you off that the, some place is doing well or a place is, is kind of struggling? Um, well, so I think, first of all, like there are a lot of ways for cities to do well. And I think one of the like maybe pitfalls of like the creative class um, framework that people are just kind of shedding right now, which is um, just to you know, briefly recap, it's this idea that um, the cities that embrace like the arts and, and um, sort of um, highly skilled knowledge workers and are more accepting of uh, gay people and have liberal values are going to succeed in the new economy. Um, and so, you know, there were like all these city initiatives to like do arts districts because it would, um, you know, it would result in X economic development. It's kind of the, the fad du jour. Um, I, I think that I think the the problem with that, which has been pointed out by others um, like Joel Kotkin, is that like 
you know, people who live in Houston uh, or Charlotte are doing fine too. And there are, and, and there are a lot of people who have kids and they want to have a detached home and live in the suburbs and drive to work and drive to the grocery store. And they don't want to live in, you know, um, Manhattan where they spend, you know, $3,000 a month on rent and, um, and live in a shoebox. Um, so I, I think like to your question, you know, how do I know when a city's doing well? I, I want to say that like, you know, first of all, there's, there's not one, there's not one model that we should all be striving for. Um, that being said, I think what I look for is, um, like a lot of locally owned business. Mm. Um, I think that's a really good sign that, um, you know, people have an opportunity, immigrants have opportunity and that people are engaging, um, with each other, like, uh, you know, what, one-on-one or that people form neighborly relationships, um, you know, which is very difficult to do with like an automated teller at um, the CVS, um, as dear as mine is to me, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, so, you know, that's everything from like bars and diners to, you know, auto repair shops and car washes. Um, I think stuff like that is, um, is, is good to see. Um, yeah, I mean, and then and then there's you know there's kind of the the broken windows thing too. I mean, obviously communities that have a lot of um, that have a lot of blight and there doesn't seem to be a lot of care for the public space. Um, you know that that's that sort of makes you scratch your head. But you know you also can't always judge a book by its cover. I mean, to cite Houston again, which is where my dad's from, um, for the most part the public spaces there are you know like dismal to say the least. But um, it's still a it's still a great city, honestly. I mean, it's not um, doesn't it doesn't look like or feel like San Francisco, and it doesn't have that kind of economy. But it's like I'd say just as good, if not better, in its own way. Do you think that that's in some way about uh, knowing what your identity is and allowing people to 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 live whatever life that they want to live in a place? I guess. Yeah, yeah, that's really well said. So like. An idea that I've been toying with recently, which um, my friends in like the real estate world think is like the stupidest idea they've ever heard, <laughs> um, <laughs> but is the idea of developing like almost like a brand standard or like an inventory of um, of like uh, identity uh, like markers in a city. So, you know, in um, Phoenix, that would be like low slung, spread out houses. Um, in a place like Charlottesville, it would be things like um, this particular shade of brick and columns that have these kind of Palladian proportions. Um, you know, uh, in, in another city where there's like a limestone quarry, it might be using a lot of limestone. Um, I don't think you have to be like slavish about that. And I don't think like boards of architectural review um, sh- like should, you know, like exert their powers to like a fascistic <laughs> degree on new development. Um, or that it should restrain creativity. But I think having kind of lookbooks like that or pattern books, I guess is really the better word um, for developers when they're in the early stages of a project and they say, oh, well, you know, it would cost just as much for us to do X as to do Y. And the former is really more in keeping with like the fabric of this community. And this is so great because I didn't have to like, you know, uh, pay an architect to do research here. (laughs) Um, I think stuff like that can can result in like um, a more cohesive um, and lasting design for a place. But to your point, it's not like that brand standard would not be the same, even from like a city, like even between neighboring cities, you know, every, every place Mm -hmm. I think has its own something special. Hmm. Well, as we kind of come to a close here, uh, you've been doing this for a few years now, and this will be your second year doing hometown, uh, but Mm -hmm. you've been involved in Tom Tom for a little bit longer, but I wonder uh, kind of how how has your perspective changed, or how, what's the biggest thing you've kind of learned uh, in this time? What is the biggest thing that I've learned during this time? I mean, so like so much. I, I will say like um, less on the city's front, but um, actually starting my own project, um, which is you know the hometown summit, has been uh, really challenging, <laughs> but also really um, really empowering to me. And I would. I would really encourage anybody who, if you've got a desk job uh, and it lets you leave work at five or six and, uh, you know, the demands of your family and personal situation are such that you can take on another project, 
you know, even for a few months a year, it's, um, it's really, it's really satisfying. It's really worth doing. I mean, there's, there's nothing that gets you engaged in the public good, um, so much as like, um, trying to bring some kind of, um, project together that requires those, this, the, the participation of that stakeholder, of those stakeholders. So, um, uh, I, I think that would, that would actually be my, my, my kind of biggest lesson is I'm just really glad that for all the, for all the time and late nights and scary moments, <laughs> um, I'm, uh, I'm, really, I'm just really glad that I had the opportunity to do this. Well, I, I think that's a very powerful perspective and it is, I think that, uh, I think you would share the same sentiment that I've often found that I think we all have a little more time than we think we do. Uh, and if we can find a valuable way to spend it, it's often repays us uh, much more than we think it can. Yeah, that's totally true. I guess, and I would amend my statement and say too, like not everybody needs to like ha- launch their own thing. Like, as you're saying, like, it just seems like every year there's like a thousand new, like nonprofit initiatives. <laughs> so it can just be like saying like, Oh, like, if you work for literacy volunteers, like, or, you know, yeah, maybe you should, vol- maybe you can volunteer for literacy volunteers five hours a week and like help them start a new, you know, literacy or citizenship day. Um, you know, just stuff that's like, that doesn't have to take over your life. Um, but getting involved is like such a, such a rewarding, um, it's such a rewarding challenge. Well, then I'll make my pitch that I always do for the listeners. If you're not on any of your city's boards or commissions, I highly encourage you to investigate because it's where powerful work happens. Um, Woo! <laughs> uh, but to, cl- uh, to close us out, I wonder if you could share, Carolyn, a story of uh, a community that's working well or what you think a community can look like when it, when it succeeds. Mm-hmm. A community that's working well. So... Um, uh, I actually, I'm going to steal an example that I heard from uh, Leah Freemau yesterday, who um, who works uh, for a CDFI uh, called, uh, which is a community development finance institution uh, called Virginia Community Capital. Again, some of y'all may be familiar with it. Mm-hmm. They do lending basically where a traditional bank wouldn't go, which doesn't mean that they like flush their money down the toilet, but they fund things where basically there's not yet a market and they need to like help give a little juice to get the market started. So she, um, she talked about uh, Clifton Forge, which is not actually a particularly low-income community, but it's, um, it's a community that is kind of like stagnating economically. Um, and uh, and uh, some, some uh, sort of community leaders got together and said, hey, we'd, we'd really like a loan to, you know, develop some tourist amenities so that we can get people – you know, out in the downtown, drinking coffee, you know, you know, shopping, stuff like that. And, um, and, and she talks about, um, the work of her organization is offering people a little bit of an incentive to find a big vision and row in a shared direction, um, together. So, um, I, I haven't been to Clifton Forge recently, so I don't want to make any big claims about how awesome it is or, or how not awesome it is, but I think, uh, that concept of, um, of of finding uh, of finding something really inspiring and 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 trying to work towards it over a defined period of time is uh, is a good place to start when I think about function communities. Well, I think that's very powerful, and I uh, thank you for your time today, Carolyn. Where can people find out more about Tom Tom and Hometown Summit? Oh well, they can find out more at tomtomfest.com backslash hometown. Very good. And if you're interested in CityWorks Expo, you can find us at cityworksxpo.com. Uh, but thank you so much for taking the time today, Carol. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me, Brad. Thank you for listening to the Big Ideas for Better Places podcast today. If you like what you hear, please subscribe and leave a rating. It really helps other people find out about our fascinating guests and find the information that we have to share. Lastly, please save the day for our upcoming event, October 5th through 7th in Roanoke, Virginia. And keep up to date by following us on Facebook and checking out our website, cityworksexpo.com. at cityworksxpo.com. Thank you guys again and look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you.